very real way, we're actually talking more about the shadow. Well, the legs of the table represent, but we're not really examining the real and see and pointing back and saying, see, you can sort of see that here. It's like our eyes and all understanding is open by looking at the shadow. And I <clears throat> hold to the fact that there's something wrong with that. And I've always felt that there was something wrong with not studying the Old Testament or the tabernacle or any of that, but with our, pro our approach, <clears throat> uh, including very little of the New Testament. You know, it just felt all explanations came pretty much from the Old Testament. And I don't have a problem with that on one hand, but on the other hand, when it comes to types and shadows, we, we would rather see the real than the, the vague shadow. And so here in John 2, <clears throat> Jesus is also, so let me word this correctly, <clears throat> Jesus is also foreshadowing um, it's sort of, I'm going to say it like this, Jesus is foreshadowing the shadow. But the real is him. He's the real thing. <clears throat> and so the picture that he's going to give us here is going to help us comprehend both the old covenant shadow and the new covenant reality that he will um, reveal to us <coughs> at Calvary. So let's look in uh, John chapter 2 and let's, we're going to read verses 13 through 22. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the, and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things from here, Make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, <clears throat> What sign showest thou us, seeing that thou doest these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. Wherefore, uh, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. <clears throat> All right. So the first significant thing that we notice is that this was the this was the time of Passover. Now you you recollect Jesus died on Passover. He was the Passover lamb. This is not that Passover. That's a couple of years down the road. But this is Passover. And Jesus goes up to Jerusalem because all <clears throat> good Jews went up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Passover. It was a law. It was uh, part of the law that all in the congregation would go up several times a year to the different feasts. You remember that? And so Jesus goes up. You'll notice the wording, though, here, and a lot of times we miss that. It says, uh, and the Jews' Passover was at hand. This isn't his. This isn't his Passover. This is the Jews' Passover. He's attending the Jews' Passover. <clears throat> um, in one sense, at the, at, the, at the exact moment, only 12 would attend Jesus' Passover. 
that's another story and we won't get into it too much. But I mean, it's, it's incredibly significant, the wording of the Bible. And yet I think people just read right over so much and they don't pick up the spirit of what's going on. And if you miss the spirit, then you miss the spirit of truth. And that's the Holy Spirit. Jesus called him that. And if you miss the spirit of truth, all you've got is cold, hard, harsh truth with no spirit in life. It's a tough sell. It's old covenant ways. All right. In verse 14, he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and dove and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. Um, there is a usual, there is a usual explanation of what's going on here by Jesus doing this. <clears throat> Anybody have any comments as to what is the usual understanding of this? Anybody? I mean, the usual spiritual explanation of what's going on here. Kelly? Good. Yeah. Shay? I don't know. I don't know if that's usual or not, though, but that's... Yeah. 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 Um, well, I've actually read about that too. Usually in relationship to the uh, lame man laid at the feet of the temple because of the particulars that go on there. But, but nonetheless, good. Somebody else? Um, I think, uh, I mean, I would hope that you would at least think this, whether that's the meaning or not, that Jesus drives out everything that they would offer but leaves himself in the temple. I'd hope you'd kind of come up with that conclusion. That all of the <clears throat> false sacrifices, the false sheep, the false dove, the false things were being driven out so that Jesus remains alone in the temple as what, what God <coughs> calls his acceptable sacrifice, the only one. Okay, is everybody okay with that one? <laughs> Although, I would have figured in this crowd, I don't know if Doug's on yet, but if he was there, he'd be screaming that. <coughs> um, and then <coughs> what Kelly said, that he's upset with them, and in anger he drives out what is not of him. And um, I remember even fairly recently, someone trying to witness, they were telling me this story, <coughs> trying to witness to one of their parents, I think it was their father, and they, the, the father had a history of bad temper. Not unlike the father's here. <clears throat> oh, Ben's not here right now. <clears throat> um, and while trying to witness to his father, he was trying to share with him about the nature of Christ. And the father <clears throat> said, well, what about that? incident in the temple where he made a scourge and drove all them people out. I mean, he, he's pretty much lost it. And uh, clearly from the, from the relating of the story, the person who was telling me the story, the, the, the family member had no answer to that. Well, okay, well, he did or whatever, you know but no, no reply. <clears throat> um, so
So <clears throat> I am going to present to you uh, an alternative <laughs> to that. And I'm going to base it solely, completely on the scriptures. <laughs> you know. And I will leave it up to you <clears throat> as to whether this is true. And now, and I must tell you that all of this ties in to where we're going with the tabernacle in this progression. But what we're going to do is in the beginning of this class, we're going to present <clears throat> John 2 up to a point. And at a certain point, we're not going to finish off, we're going to stop, and we're going to go back to this, this history part of the taking of the ark and how significant, how significant that was, uh, and, and very significant to the progression of the house of God, <clears throat> very significant. <clears throat> All right, so, um, but before I do that, I want to <clears throat> I want to show the thing why people think that Jesus was all upset and did what he did <clears throat> and the thing that most people identify as the actual issue and I'm going to show you that even though it's in, mentioned in these scriptures <clears throat> it is not the issue it is a byproduct and not the motive of Jesus at all. <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's see. Let's just look at verse uh, 15 and 16 again. <clears throat> and when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, take these things from here, Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. Now, some of you who've been around for a while <clears throat> know that when a story is related in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or two or three of those books, <clears throat> that each of those writers are coming with a different aspect of Christ. They're coming at it from a different angle, and they word things differently. John's wording is not at all what we really think of the wording. Um, his wording is, I'm just going to read it, uh, take these things from here, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Doesn't ma mention anything about prayer, doesn't mention anything about the other subjects. <clears throat> he specifically hones in on these simple words, house of merchandise. <clears throat> all right. Um, so let me read my notes and I don't know how that's going to save my throat because I'm still talking but here we go one thing is clear if these sacrifices were to stand as a type and shadow of his death on the cross meaning, meaning all sheep all doves that were offered were a type and shadow of Christ on the cross do you agree? Yes. Okay. so if they're to stand as a type and shadow of his death on the cross, then they fall far short of that representation. Why? Absolutely. Because these men were profiting by the sacrifice while making others pay. This is in direct contradiction to the very definition of sacrifice. Jesus paid the debt while others received his sacrifice as a free gift. This was Jesus' offense with them. They made it a house of merchandise. All right. Are we all in agreement that that, <clears throat> that is a well-recognized, I mean, on some level, maybe not the full thing of what I said, but on some level, that is a well-recognized explanation of the actions of Jesus. Okay, well, now, again... I'm here to tell you, based on the surrounding scriptures, that that's not it at all. That that was an issue, but it was only an issue of them, not the issue of what he was doing that had eternal ramifications. Do you believe it's possible to have issues with people 
and still be motivated by Christ? Do you believe that, <clears throat> I'm going to make up something here. God knows something like this will happen and you'll go, he was preparing me. Somebody comes to you and says, you know, that you've, you've got, you know, you've got all these problems and stuff. Somebody comes to you and says, well, we're going to have to take you out of your position that you've been serving the Lord in this church in. Um, <clears throat> and that person actually not do that based on all your failures and faults, but do, does that totally because there's a whole other thing at work that relates to the Lord. Can you believe that could happen? I sound like an attorney that's trying to get, you know, what is the thing where you, reasonable doubt here, or, re, or reasonable belief, <clears throat> whatever the case may be. Um, so, um, uh, I, am, I am convinced that in coming into that temple, Jesus saw these guys, saw what was supposed to represent sacrifice, and said, you guys don't even have a clue what sacrifice represents. You're, you're the exact opposite. You're making money off everybody. You're, you're getting rich. You're gaining, and you're making my father's house a house of merchandise. All right. <clears throat> but that's not the spirit of what's going on here. <clears throat> and let me say this. If I can prove to you that something else is going on, could we all maybe admit that we can actually misread Jesus and his actions? <laughs> Indubitably. <laughs> and so... Uh, <laughs> And so I think that, I think, I think it is important that God, through this class, be able to show that there can be something completely other going on. And we can see, because we walk by sight, something, even in Jesus, and assume that that must be that, and then preach that around the world. That Jesus, you know, got upset with those guys in the temple, tore up the place, and he kicked them all out. Bless God. And I'll do the same thing to you if you, you know, I'm speaking as a legalistic Pentecost pastor. <clears throat> all right. So, um, Clearly, Jesus would have a problem with the fact that those who are supposed to represent him in the temple are making merchandise of people instead of being sacrificial in themselves, willing to lay down their life, willing to lose that others might gain, willing to suffer loss, willing to go through things for the gain of others. That's not the full story. <clears throat> All right, verse 17. <clears throat> and his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Okay, so there's part of the explanation right there, folks. It wasn't anger that moved him. It was zeal. Okay? And zeal, you know, is a positive thing, and let me just read this, but remember it was zeal for the house of the Lord that moved Jesus and not anger over the failures of men. And uh, <clears throat> this, uh, the proof of this can be seen in Jesus' response to the Jews' demand in verse 18. So we're going to continue a little longer in this with a little more explanation, but as I said, the full explanation won't come until what time we have covered this taking of the ark. Um, 
Verse 18, then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? <clears throat> Notice that they are questioning Jesus' actions of driving out the sacrifices, okay? Uh, they wanted to know why he did these things. Jesus may disagree with their methods, but he does what he does based on God reasons. And would to God that we all did that too. In other words, God doesn't have to make you blind to every fault and failure of people. He doesn't have to make you blind to that. He has to make you into the image of his son to be able to, in spite of that, still move with the Father and not be motivated by the junk. Not to look down on others, not to uh, um, put people in a box because they failed over and over in one area. When God, when, when, the, when the impartation of the life of Christ, not just the Savior within our heart, comes, there's hope for everyone because Christ is the hope and Christ is the answer and Christ is the fulfillment and it's, it's not about us. It's not about, you know, if you're doing good right now, it's not about you. <laughs> it's not. It's not about your good. It's not about your bad. It's not about your good. It's about Christ and if, and if we are not pursuing Christ to be the inhabitant of these temples, and we're missing the eternal plan. <clears throat> All right. Um, so they're they're asking. They're literally asking Jesus, "Why did you do these things?" Right? Verse verse eighteen. Isn't that exactly what the point is? What? Explain yourself. Explain why you did these things. What's up? You know? What's up with that, Jesus? Let him, you know. So Jesus, in verse 19, Jesus answered. This is Jesus' answer to them of what I did and why. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. <laughs> what? 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 What kind of answer is that? Have you ever noticed how many times it says, and Jesus answered, and you go, what, what kind of answer is that? That's, yeah, that's not an answer. That, I, I am more confused by you telling me what you just said. I'm not going to ask you anything again. <laughs> I think this is one of those cases, unless God opens your eyes to see the real issues of what, you know, exactly what's going on here. <clears throat> Um, so let me read again also take note how Jesus' response to their demands for an expl explanation for what he has just done has no mention of the money changers everybody notice that? I mean look real carefully at your Bible he, he, he didn't go well that was darn money changers I'll tell you why I did it because <laughs> they're making merchandise of the house of God and that hacks me off. And so, you know, you call it anger, I call it zeal, but I went in there and I whipped their tails. No. He doesn't mention any of that. Because that's not where it's coming from. And if you're going to give the rest of my sharing, then... I know, I know. I was just saying, you know... If, if it's the reason that people say it is, then why didn't he do it every time he went into a Yeah. Well, the answer to that is this scared them enough that none of them ever came back. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Let me tell you, greed, it's hard to drive off for completely, you know. <clears throat> All right. So uh, Jesus' words before they asked this question and it's funny. I mean, I just think the Lord is, is funny in some of this stuff because his words before they asked him and then he really gave them the explanation 
seemed to point to the fact that he got upset and drove them out. I mean, because he says, take these things from here, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And that's before we ask him what, why he did what he did. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, it's a good idea to ask Jesus anyway. <laughs> you with me? It's a good idea to check in. It's a good idea not to assume that you know, well, Jesus said so and so, so this must be it. Did he say it to you? And did he say it to you in response to, is this what you mean by this? Is these words what you mean by these actions? Because those words was not what he meant by those actions. They were not what he meant by those actions. <clears throat> and if what I'm saying is true, then there, there needs to be a more tender heart toward the Lord, toward Jesus, to say, Lord, you you know, I mean, come on, Lord, you know, I thought I'd check in this month. Well, that ain't Lord, that's, that's boss, and once a month you pick up your paycheck. <laughs> so that's the only reason why you go, go to him, you know. <clears throat> no, there's more going on here. All right, so... Um, so also take note how Jesus' response to their demand for an explanation for what he has just done has no mention of the money changers. Why? Because his action was not based upon men's failures, not based upon his own anger, not based on righting a wrong situation. His explanation for what his actions symbolized, according to his answer to them, had to do with destroying the temple and raising it up in three days. In other words, by him driving out that which was to be sacrificed, Jesus was giving us a picture of the cross. <clears throat> All right, I know that's still not absolutely clear yet. Let's read verse 20 and 21. <coughs> Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. Wilt thou make raise it up in three days? But, but he spoke of the temple of his body. <coughs> um, <clears throat> so we get a further explanation. We get a further explanation that this is moving far away from the concept of men's failures in the temple and we're being taken to the very cross. We're being taken in, again, <clears throat> clearer type, but in type and shadow of what this taking of the ark is all about. Okay? Um, so verse uh, 21, but he spoke of the temple of his body. Mm, all right. <clears throat> of course, the Jews did not get the point. Their response to this new statement by Jesus caused them to focus on the actual building of the physical temple in which they stood. I mean, because they all, they're all standing in the temple right then. Remember, Jesus goes in the temple, drives them out, didn't say he left. He said, they're all there, and they're going, what does this mean? What are you doing? Jesus, I'm going to say it like this, but Jesus is living in another place, in another realm, in another understanding. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, <coughs> they didn't get it. Their response to this new statement by Jesus caused them to focus on the actual building of the physical temple in which they stood. <clears throat> because even when we read the Gospels, we are supposed to see Christ and Him crucified. When we, we you know, we here have learned <clears throat> that when you read the Psalms, you should see Christ and Him crucified. When you read Genesis, you should see Christ and Him crucified. 
But we haven't learned that when you read the Gospels, <clears throat> we should also see Christ and him crucified. <clears throat> but the Lord saw that that temple is simply a shadow and a picture of, his, of the true temple, which was his body. Why? Because he walked as the actual first true tabernacle of God. In his mind, these shadows were never meant to be anything. They weren't meant to be get, get all caught up in. They weren't meant to become... Um, huge issues in your life and <clears throat> when he's come now he was always that way but when he's come to the earth he's literal the true tabernacle the first actual God with us tabernacle that God had in mind all along so all of this is periphery it's temporal it's <clears throat> it's um uh, it's a non-issue. So he doesn't even, he can, he, uh, let me say it like, he functions in the realm of the real. Yes. And we tend to function in the realm of the religious. Mm -hmm. And so we don't see Jesus, we don't see the truth, we don't, we don't see the spirit of truth. We're too busy like these Jews going, well, now how's he going to do that? You know, you know, it's like um, Nicodemus when Jesus said, you must be born again. Well, how are you going to do that? Is a man going to be able to go back into his mother's womb and come out again? And if you're born again, will you have two navels? <clears throat> oh, it just came to me. <laughs> Jesus is going, you don't even know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> well, of course we don't. Because in the old covenant back here, we were introduced to Israel and history and great men and stories. And from a little child, we were told about David and Goliath. We were told about Abraham offering Isaac and all those stories <clears throat> and we communicate those to the children and to everyone we preach it <clears throat> and we make that the real and the only real real was when Jesus stepped onto the scene as the true <clears throat> tabernacle of God not Moses' tabernacle although that's what it was called tabernacle in the wilderness he was the fulfillment of that and all of that was just nothing it's it's shadow puppets i mean i'm telling you the truth it was it, you know you go oh so you don't care about those people? no okay. i'm not talking about my personal care for people i love all those people if they were here now i would hug all 80 billion of them but we're talking about reality as God knows it. Okay? We're talking about reality as God knows it, and God knows we don't know reality as he knows it. God knows that we get caught up in material things and religion and, you know, well, I, I can't do this, I want to do that, I did that, all this, and, you know. And they were doing that. I mean, here, the actual tabernacle of God, the real one, the one of which everything only pointed to is there. And they're, you know, they're sitting there looking at the temple and going, well, you going to tear this thing down in three days and build it up again? Well, good luck there, bucko. You know? <clears throat> He's going, I can't even talk to you people. <laughs> can't even talk to you because you are so caught up in the visible material reality that you can't see me while I'm standing right here with you. So, 
I said, uh, <clears throat> but the Lord saw that temple as simply a shadow and a picture of the true temple, his body. Why? Because he walked as the actual first true tabernacle of God. In other words, God's plan for a dwelling place among men never was focused on a tent or a physical structure called a temple. All right. Well, I think we get that. I think we get that. <clears throat> All right. I want. I need to give a little. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> parenthesis here, although it's not. It is a necessary part, and that is to give an explanation of this transition from the. Tabernacle in the wilderness to Solomon's temple. Okay? It is the same transition as, remember this was the history, history, history of Israel. And over here is the spiritual reality. Moses' tabernacle is equated with with the incarnation. Moses' tabernacle is the shadow equivalent of Christ incarnate in the flesh. And remember now, I mean I don't I shouldn't have to go back to cover all the scriptures that we went over uh, also here in John, <clears throat> that Jesus tabernacled among us, that there are so many scriptures in the New Testament that talk about your physical body as your tabernacle. Okay? Well, Jesus is not just got a body. He's got the Father in there. Remember? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's, he's really the tabernacle, and the Father is God with us. I mean, in the truest reality, it is, you know. When they questioned him, you remember the time, what is that, over in John 5? <clears throat> all of this is so good because it's all in John, you know. I mean, it really is. The, the Gospel of John really is the explanation of these, these things. <clears throat> but um, in John 5, Jesus healed somebody on the Sabbath. Then they said to him, well, you can't work on the Sabbath. This, you know, remember the Pharisees came to Jesus. They said, you, you, uh, 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 we don't do that. That's breaking the law, God. You were working on the Sabbath. We caught you. You're out of there. <clears throat> and they thought they had him dead to rights. I remember the day I saw the true meaning of that and Jesus' response. And I just went, he's so different than us, you know. There are places that he says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath and stuff, but it wasn't there. There he says, I didn't do it. My father that lives in me did that. I didn't heal that guy. That was the father. <laughs> you know, the, the God you call your God, he did it. He, Jesus, <clears throat> in the Gospel of John, is so completely absorbed and saturated in this truth that as he walks this earth, he is the tabernacle of which the Old Testament spoke. It's finally come. It's here now. No need studying the old story. Let's study the real. Are you, are you sort of following me now when I talk about looking at shadows? Gospel of John gives us an incredible picture of this tabernacle of Moses, not a good name again, tabernacle in the wilderness, Christ being the fulfillment, God with us. All right. So then, so we have the, uh, that tabernacle equated with Jesus in his incarnation. And, and the word incarnation means in flesh. 
I guess if Patty were in here, I, I, we'd call it in carne. In Spanish, that means in flesh. Incarnation. Okay? <clears throat> then, the spiritual equivalent of the taking of the ark is the cross. Now realize, we have not given that explanation yet, have we? But we're going to, and we're going to look at it from several different angles so that we can nail it down that actually was what was going on there. We didn't get that in the shadow. It was too vague. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you with me? Because it's, it's going to shine bright in the reality of the Lord. <clears throat> All right? And then Solomon's temple is equivalent to what? Resurrection. Sorry? Resurrection. The resurrection. Less? Well, the temple is not. It's, uh, we'll just call it the church. Body of Christ. <laughs> Sorry, Jesus. He looks more like Chris than he does Christ, but that's. There's a little cross right there in the priest. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So, there is this. There is this uh, necessity of a transition from Moses' tabernacle to Solomon's ta temple. God sees it. Israel understands it once it became their history that it moved from being this small place where God dwelt with them in the wilderness and partially for a short time in the land to moving into the most glorious temple you ever saw. Big and glorious and grandiose and all that. I mean, just incredible workmanship. <clears throat> and here, it, everything's more, if you will. <clears throat> and God always had this transition in mind. He never, he never just had this tabernacle in the wilderness as the end goal. Now, I hope you're equating this down as I talk here because he never had the incarnation of Christ as the end goal. Christ came in incarnation to die on a cross and to bring forth something more glorious than just him being down here with us in his body. Hello. Hello. But this, you know, I mean, we say this up here and we go, well, you know, Israel, uh, that little tabernacle, they were going to keep growing and they were going to need something bigger. So God had, you know, thank God he thinks big and he said, well, let's make a big temple. And then we all go, oh, praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Is that all we see? Is that the junk we see? I mean, you, I understand seeing that in history. But if that's a shadow, if that's a shadow of the truth, we need to grab hold of the reality of God in Christ and realize, <clears throat> may I say it, Jesus in the Gospels, oh, I hate to say it with this Texas accent, Jesus in the Gospels ain't it. Jesus on the resurrection side of the cross bringing forth, and we call it the church, the body of Christ. There's another word. What can we use? How about yeah, that and there's many of those. Let's use this one. Temple. Because we're the temple of the Lord. Amen? <clears throat> we're not the tabernacle of God. We're the temple of God. That immediately relates us over to here. You see that? So, <clears throat> Jesus walks. For, he, he's, he's on earth for 33 and a half years. He walks in ministry for three and a half years. <clears throat> what does he do? He does miracles. 
What else? Healings. What else? Deliverance. Pretty much you find in the average church. Teaching parables and, you know, da-da-da-da, right? <clears throat> and he did all that stuff, and it gets down to the end, and you can mark it right clearly in one of the Gospels where he makes a transition where he turns and, sa- and starts looking away from this incarnation existence and starts looking towards here. It's in the Gospel of John. What a surprise. Again, Gospel of John, because... The gospel of John is giving us the spiritual progression from tabernacle to temple. It's outlining the reality of God. And and I'm going to take, Lord willing, we ever get to it, I'm going to take one of the chapters and just, we're going to go through that chapter and we're going to see it. Jesus just, he talks and he talks from this reality that he's talking right here in chapter 2. He's coming from that. And again, they're all confused because they're trying to figure out his words instead of knowing reality, even knowing the shadow, and then fitting all this over the shadow and going, oh, oh. It's like, especially today, so many Christians have just been taught Christianity as... An alternative religion to Judaism. It's not. Christianity, as some you know, as as some would know it in truth, is the fulfillment of all of all that Judaism gave us as a picture. And we are supposed to understand ourselves in light of the old covenant, not as some new, dreamt up, different thing that has nothing to do with that. And we just, you know, now we just, uh, we build buildings with steeples and and pews. We're nothing like them, man. We got pointy things on our buildings. And, and things called pews. Yeah. I agree, pew. What I'm saying is, I'm not, you know, and I sound like I'm just sarcastic. I'm not really trying to be sarcastic. I'm trying to shock us into a reality that Jesus is walking as the fulfillment of these things, and if we're totally ignorant of them, how are we ever going to figure out Jesus? Can I get amen on that one? I mean, if he's walking as the fulfillment of something, if we don't know what he's fulfilling, then we don't know what he's doing. we got to admit that. And he he, he knew, he, he was aware of the tabernacle of Moses, but now he's, he's saying, I'm it. Whatever that was, it, it's gone. And it didn't have any power anyway. But I'm here. All right. So in John 12, 24, the Greeks began to come to seek him. Sir, they come to his disciples. Sir, we would see Jesus. Here's another one of those Jesus answered. You know, Greeks are coming to seek Jesus. Come on. You know, you got people from other parts of the world coming all the way there, and we want to see Jesus. It says, and Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. What? What kind of answer is that? We just want to see you, Okay. You know, don't give us that gibberish. That ain't gibberish, folks. That ain't gibberish. That's the highest level of spiritual communication. It's the cross, and we don't get it. We don't get it. We don't get it. They didn't get it. But Jesus is making a demarcation line at that point, and he's saying, I haven't brought forth any fruit 
Don't call my miracles fruit. They're not fruit. They're gifts. Don't call my healing fruit. It's not fruit. They were just gifts. Don't call anything that I've done to this point fruit because that none of it is after my kind. I'm still the only seed that ever existed of this form. Son of God. I'm the only seed. And only if I die will I be able to bring forth fruit. Okay. Well, how do we, how do we equate that with what we're talking about here? Well, the fruit is the increase and the multiplication found in the church, the body of Christ, where Christ is inhabiting many more of us than just one body. And there... <clears throat> He's looking, he's, 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 as it were, turning his back on Moses' tabernacle. When it's before the taking of the ark, he's turning his back on that and he's looking with lofty eyes into the eternal plan of God, not just the future, the eternal plan of God, that there would be, I would have a body that was so numbered so full of me in my life, a house that I would inhabit. And for the joy set before him, he endures the cross. Because he says, a temple will be greater to God than a tabernacle. I'm crazy, don't you? <laughs> well, I am partially, but that. <clears throat> we've, we've had people watching every teaching I have just to get me to say that so that they can put that on YouTube. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so I'm going to read this in, in a short amount of time, this one paragraph. In the history of Israel, there came a time when they transitioned from the tabernacle being central to the temple. The incarnation of Christ represents what the tabernacle in the wilderness was only a faint picture. He was the true expression of God with us that God had in mind all along. However, just as the tabernacle in the wilderness was only a transition structure before the building of the temple, so the incarnated Christ was a temporary and smaller example of what he would bring forth in the resurrection in terms of the temple of his body, the church. All right. <clears throat> so we'll stop and then uh, we'll, we'll try to get a little more into this taking of the ark and this transition that must take place. <clears throat>